I, I probably need to say some things about this PowerPoint before I start it. First of all, it's going to uh, appear to you to be connected to some of the things we've talked about here in the last week. It, everything is interconnected. This is not driven by anything that we talked about in the last week. That's just a disclaimer. I started this actually weeks ago, which brings me to point two. You're going to say, really, it took you weeks to come up with this? I'm not going to talk about anything really, really deep, but I'm going to talk about some things that are pretty deep in the scriptures that require some extraction, that require some knowledge of the scripture and some reading fairly deeply to pull these things out. They're there. But there, there's something that's not a deep concept, but something that you aren't really going to get from it at a first glance. Okay. That said, light of the world, and on beyond the pretty picture. What can we see about God through these things? And I'm talking the bullet points. What can we see about God through these? He chose to enlighten us. He gave his son. His plan of three heaven and earth ages. The destruction of those who oppose him. And the exalting and glorifying of those who exalt and glorify him. And I would hope that by this we can see that he must be acknowledged. And I would add to this, I don't have it on screen, he must be acknowledged by name. And that will become more apparent in some of the scriptures we read. That we have to acknowledge and say, Yah, the God of the Hebrews, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Jesus, is the God. That he's a loving and rational and exacting father. Exacting can carry a bit of a negative connotation, meaning that someone's too picky. But if you're talking about something, let's just give you an example. You're making cookies or some cake that requires a lot of ingredients. How important is it that you are exacting in following that recipe? And those of you who do a lot of cooking know that there are some recipes that require exact adherence to the instructions or they don't work right. If you don't beat something long enough or you beat it too long or you beat it too fast or not fast enough or you mix things in the wrong order or you mix some of the wet ingredients with the dry ingredients. The point being, God gives us some pretty complex things to comprehend in his prophecies, but some real simple things to understand in things pertaining to Christian living. We have to see that it, it's the same God saying all of those things, and what do we pull out of that? Second Corinthians 6, 11 through 18. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. And I think that this is Paul and the people that were with him while he was writing. He's speaking for them as a, as a group. To these people at Corinth. We have spoken openly to you, to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now, in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? I'm going to pause before I go to the rest of the reading for a second here. Our subject was the light of the world. And I think, I hope, we're going to understand before we're done here that what the light source is, 
what the reflective surface is and what it reflects on. What sees the light that's reflecting off of that surface. And we have to be able to distinguish all of those. The source of the light, the surface it's reflecting off of, and who sees that? And what do they see? And what happens if you have light that shines against a curved mirror? Either way. Or if it's a wavy mirror, if it's bad glass in the mirror, then there's distortion to the light. Right? Just want you to think about all this. But here Paul, the author, is saying to these people, I, I want you to be open, not only with us, but to what's going on in your own life, What's affecting you? And he says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for or because there should not be fellowship between righteousness and lawlessness and communion between light and dark. You know, the word communion is interesting. This is kind of a side note. It is not found anywhere other than in these letters to the Church of Corinth. You aren't going to find the word communion in, in your King James Bible. You don't even find the word that's translated communion in any of the three gospel accounts where we get what we understand to be the communion. This word is not used in other places where that's talked about in the Scriptures. This is the only place. So how do we understand the word communion? We understand it by the places that don't use the word, that explain it. So often there are going to be words used for communion other than the word communion. The three Gospels say he took bread, he broke it, and said eat. He took the cup and said drink. Paul in this letter, or in the first letter, which is actually not the first letter, but the second, that's a whole other subject, said, the bread which we break, is it not the communion? The cup which we drink, is it not the communion? There we've made the full connection between the words in that text. Okay? But here he's saying, and fellowship is a very closely related word. Should not be fellowship between righteous and lawless. Should not be communion between light and dark. And what concord, what agreement, has Christ with Belial? And concord or accord can be more of a, an accord can be a covenant or an agreement between people in a written form. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Part, as in partnership, fellowship, communion, in accordance, under a contract with, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For. So he's saying all of these things to get to this. You are the temple of the living God. And if you know much about the temple, that is said to be the residence of the Spirit of God. The house of God. And if you read Ezekiel carefully, the first 12 chapters are entirely dedicated to Ezekiel getting a very vivid vision to show him that the presence and spirit of God could also go with the captives that were righteous into the deserts, off across the Euphrates River. But he also shows him that the temple that it was in Jerusalem at the time of Ezekiel was so steeped in worship of false gods that the vision that Ezekiel sees is that presence of God starting to lift up out of that temple, go up out, clear out of the city, and off to the east, over to what we call the Mount of Olives. And God's words to Ezekiel is, you see what's going on here? Why should I stay here? 
And then he goes on to say, all the things I've been saying that I'm going to do in destroying these people, you're never going to be able anymore to say, that's for a day coming in the future. It's going to happen right now. And that's chapter 12 of Ezekiel. The point being, the temple of God, and if he tells the church, you are it, you are where God dwells, then the next statement should be self-evident. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Which should remind us of, of John's record of Jesus' words where he says, not at Jerusalem, not at this city anymore, not at this mountain, but people that worship God will worship him in spirit and in truth regardless of their location on the planet. So, verse 17, therefore, so here's the result. Here's what Paul says. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So there are several fours and therefores in this that we have to look at. But we also have to consider what it is he's saying, don't do so that God will be your God. If you want him to dwell with you, then you have to remove the stuff that he doesn't like. That's the nutshell version. Isaiah 51, 1 through 6. To Israel. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look back through your nation, through its history. Go even this far back. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone, and blessed him and increased him. Four, because this is the causation. The Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. And in the adult lesson this morning, we talked about that, or I did anyway, talked about the fact that sometimes God has to take the garbage out to clean the room up. So if he says, I'm going to make this place glorious, he has to get rid of those things that make it dirty. It's the only way to do it. You have to get rid of them. They have to go away. And that last text we read, Paul was giving us a clue as to why. God won't dwell with bad stuff. He won't dwell with things that disagree with him. And he told, through Paul, he told the church, you get rid of that stuff so that he will dwell with you. Whatever that stuff is. Right? And he, 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 we have this, our subject is light of the world. So let's see how that applies here. He goes on, listen to me, my people, and give ear to me, O my nation, for law will proceed from me, and I will make my justice rest as a light of the peoples. Once again, remember the source of the light, the reflective surface, and who sees it? My righteousness is near. My salvation has gone forth. And my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait upon me. And my arm they will trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. And look on the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment, and those who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not be abolished. But it requires a house cleaning first. 
He referred to, to Abraham. He said, look to Abraham, who I called alone. Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land. He was here amongst a bunch of people. Get out. Go over here amongst a bunch of people. Hold your thoughts for a second. Joshua 24, verses 2 through 3. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river, that would be the Euphrates, in old times, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. Now therefore, this is down at verse 14 in the text now. Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, or Yah, choose for yourselves this day, and Yah is, is just a, let me clarify, Yah, Yah, Hova, Yahweh, Jehovah, we're just moving further there to the English version of that word, they in Hebrew do not pronounce the J, as a, it's a Yah, okay? And the original name was actually just what we would call consonants. They were vowel sounds. They had kind of a supplied uh, vowel sound with them. Enough on that. My point is, I didn't want you to not know who I'm talking about when I say Yah. The name, the proper name of the God of Israel. It says, so now therefore serve that God. Serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. If it seems evil to you to serve the God of Israel, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. God said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your father's house, from your family, and go to a land that I'm going to show you. He left a land where his family was there worshiping false gods, and he went to a land where there were other people serving false gods. So he did not tell Abraham to leave to go somewhere where there wasn't any possibility of being a false god. So we have to ask ourselves, then why did he make him separate? And this is where you have to think. What was the difference? And why did God not even... The only thing he said to, to Abraham before Lot and him separated was, okay, this is the place. You're there. You can quit walking now. It wasn't until him and Lot separated that he had completed the act of separating from his house and his family that God said, okay, now, turn around and look at everything. I'm going to give you all this. I'm going to make you this blessing. The other thing that we read in, in Genesis 12, it says, God had said to him. He said it when he was still in Ur of the Chaldees. But when he, he waited for him to complete the mission of separating from all of them. Why? Because if you're staying with your family and they're worshiping false gods, how do people think about you? But if you pick up and go away from your family, what does that say? I think different than them. That's what that says. The people of that land knew him as a stranger. And when they talked God, he talked a different God than them. But with his family, as long as he was with his family, he was perceived as with that family. 
This isn't just about family. That isn't my subject today. What I'm trying to get you to see is how God determines what he's going to do with whom. And how does that relate to this light of the world, the source of the light, what it reflects off of, and what those looking at those people see, or that surface, right? Kind of gave myself away there. Romans 9, 17 and 18. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he, the God of Abraham, the God of Israel, the God of the Christ, the God of us, has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. But the purpose for this, I should have made the four at the beginning of this in red too, because this is the very reason why he does it. To show his power and that his name would be declared. So he's looking for people who will reflect his power and his name. John 1. And now notice I didn't say King James, New King James, NASV. I just have John 1, 1 through 5, because Tony tweaked this. If you want to talk to me about it afterward, you can. I can show you every place where I found the various translations to put this together. This is basically the New King James, but I've altered it a little bit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This was in the beginning with God. All things were made through it, and without it, nothing was made that was made. In it, in the word of God, was life, and the life was the light, or the enlightenment of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Why didn't the darkness comprehend it? I'm working it backwards. Why didn't they comprehend it? What is the darkness? And what is the light that they saw? What was the source of the light? I hope that in this text you can see what the source of the light is. The Word of God, and it was there in the beginning, and the Word was God. It represents Him. It's the only thing we have that represents him, is his word and the things that happened as a result of his word. That would be what he does, right? But it says here that everything that was done, everything that was made, was a result of that word. And that word is just the representation of what he thought, what he thinks. That's the light. The thinking of God is the light. That's the source. So what does it reflect off of? Well, I hope it's us. It was Israel, because that's what Isaiah said. He said the message of God was the light for them, the enlightenment, and it would be the enlightenment of all the people. So what's the darkness? And what is it about light? in a really dark room. You know, we go to a black box theater, and black box theaters are kind of interesting because they were really designed to make a real emphasis on what happens to be going on center stage. If you have a really dark room and you shine a bright light right on one thing, everybody's attention is drawn to that, and there's not much else to deflect that attention, right? So in darkness, light seems really light. If you've ever been in a dark room where someone turned off all the lights in a gymnasium and you see that little slit of light underneath the door or something and, and it seems really bright and after a while, if you let your eyes adjust, you finally start feeling a little more comfortable about moving around, right? But the darkness did not comprehend it. More on that. 
John 3, a couple chapters into the further, verses 17 through 21. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. So this kind of answers the last question. That light has come into the world, and men... There you go. You want to know who darkness was? Light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light. They did not want to be enlightened. Why do people not want to be enlightened? You have to ask yourself that. When someone's offered an understanding of something, and they go, I don't want to hear it. We have to be grown up enough to understand that. Why do they not want to hear it? Now, what we decide to do after that may vary, right? Whether we're going to continue to talk or not talk. But you have to ask yourself, why does someone not want to understand something? But here Jesus says, the light came into the world and men loved darkness rather than light. Okay, he goes on to tell us why, or at least John does. Really, this is John's commentary where Jesus' words could be argued. But John, speaking for Jesus, says, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But here's, here's the thing. If you're one of the enlightened and you're looking into the darkness and that darkness doesn't want the light, you already know that what they're doing is evil. Hopefully. We should be able to recognize that because we have the light. If we can't recognize that what they're doing is wrong, are we in darkness? And we don't have time to read every reference on this. I suggest you read the center section of Ephesians 5 and see about light and what it reveals, according to Paul. Everyone practicing evil deeds hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the truth that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. There's something underlying here in this text that I think needs to be pointed out. Movement. Do we see movement in this text? Everyone who does this comes or doesn't come, right? Everyone who practices evil hates the light and does not come to the deed or to the light. The one who does who does truth does truth. That's always an interesting concept to me. How do you do truth? You can do righteousness. How do you do truth? Well, truth is righteousness. It's the, re it's the real reality. When we talk about God having to take the garbage out, it's how God sorts out what is garbage and what's savable. That's the truth. That's the light. That's what makes us know how we should behave if we don't want to be thrown out. It's the checklist. Am I doing this? Am I doing this? Am I doing this? Am I doing this? Am I not doing this? Am I not doing this? Am I not doing this? And the people that go, I don't want to know that because I already know what I'm doing isn't very good. And I'm not saying this as a condemnation. Jesus already stated what the condemnation is. The condemnation is that they don't accept the name of Christ as being the point of salvation and accept that what they're doing is wrong. I don't have to judge that. I'm so happy. But what I have to do is see 
the information that's offered to make the choice about behavior. Genesis 6, 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man forever. Do you ever have a parent say, I've about had it with you. I'm tired of saying this to you. I'm not going to keep saying this. If I have to stop this car, and any continuation, right? For he is indeed flesh. Yeah, God says, I'm not going to strive with him forever. He's flesh. I'm the potter. He's the clay. Keith made a point at church camp. Crash. Yet his days shall be 120 years. He says, I'm going to give human beings another 120 years while this guy I like over here that I'm going to be gracious to builds a box. And then it's all going to end. Remember one of the things in the list was, what do we learn from God in the fact that he says, I'm going to have these three heaven and earth periods. First one, whoosh, destroyed by water. Second one, whoosh, destroyed by fire. And then everything's going to be perfect. That's the final cleanup. James 4, verses 4 through 10. Now, there's some things in light blue here. And the reason why I do this, and one of the excellent places to look for this, is if you're reading in the Diaglot, or if you're capable of reading the original <coughs> Greek manuscripts, and there's some difference here. Even, even Benjamin Wilson in the Diaglot acknowledges that, that uh, some of the manuscripts have this, some of them don't. Some of them do not have adulterers and adulteresses. It just says adulteresses. But I have the, the change in blue, and that will reflect in some of the other things later on in the text. Now think about that. In the Old Testament, in the prophets, who did God call adulteresses? People who followed other gods or followed their own desires? So James says, adulterers and adulteresses, however you read this, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Why? Because God can't dwell with evil. He won't dwell there if it's bad. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Now, this is an interesting phrase. In the King James, it says it more like it would imply that this is our spirit and our desires. But as I look at the Greek to the, to the ability that I can on the other translations, it carries, and this is a straight, I didn't change these words. This is exactly what it says in the New King James. The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. God is a jealous God. He said in Genesis, I will not strive with man forever. Isaiah, he said, I am going to beautify this land, but I am going to, with fire, clean up the rest of the place. We're going to have to burn up cleaning fire. And my law will go out. I will be the light of the people. But, and some of the texts in the Greek seems to support this, it gives more grace. The it would have to be either the scriptures, if you go to the nearest antecedent, it would be the spirit who dwells in us, which would be God, which in effect would be the same thing. It gives more grace, therefore it says, or he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Do we see movement? 
Do we see migration in this? I hope. We have to move. We can't stay in the middle. We have to go one way or the other. Choice is ours. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Keith made a good point Wednesday night. He read a text from the old minor prophets. Showed what God did with Israel when they weren't behaving. Moved away from them. That's what that text in Ezekiel 1-12 through 12 is telling us. That he wasn't going to stay there. Not only was he going to destroy their land, destroy their city, destroy their place of worship, but he wasn't going to stay there with them. And he was going to ignore them when they pray. Read Jeremiah, read Isaiah, read Ezekiel, see if that isn't true. That that's what he said. He goes on to say, Cleanse your hearts, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you devil mind, and lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Now this does not undo the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. What James is saying here is in the light of the fact that he said, adulterers and adulteresses. If you're not behaving, then you need to cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, not be double-minded, lament and mourn and weep. That's called repentance. That's all he's talking about here. Change your thinking about this. Figure out this is going to be your destruction and do what is right. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Matthew 5, 11 through 16. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you have not sat down and read the prophets, if you haven't read the story of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, see what they went through at the hands of the people who did not like the enlightenment they were trying to bring them. Who doesn't want to know what's going to happen in something that's important to you? Those prophets were just coming to them and saying, look, if you don't straighten up, things are going to go terribly wrong here. Your cities are going to be destroyed. You're going to be hauled away captive. But it's not too late. You can change your ways. And yet they went, don't tell us that. Just tell us good things are going to happen. And what they physically did to those men is, I believe, what Jesus is talking about here. The ones who wanted to beat them up because they didn't have good things to say in their opinion. But they were actually providing them their salvation. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And that is exactly what God allowed to happen to Israel. And if we had the time, I'd take you to Isaiah and read you where he says, you were thrown down on the street like a garment and trampled on. So he said, but the day's coming, I'm not going to let that happen anymore. I'm going to do it to the ones that did it to you. But here on this subject, you're the salt of the earth. You're what gives me a good flavor for me, not me. Your proper behavior is what makes you taste good to God. If you lose that taste, it's not good for anything other than to be thrown out. You are the light of the world. Now we already read the, the words of Jesus himself and the words of John saying that the source of the light is God. So if we're the light of the world, 
That means we're the mirror. We're the reflective surface. The pureness of the glass, the straightness of the glass, affects how that light reflects on the rest of the world. I believe that's why he called Abraham out of his family. Because to the rest of the world, they were getting a distorted view. He was living among people that worshipped a different God. As a family unit. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, a mirror works two directions. Take a flashlight, you shine it on a mirror, and it reflects off that mirror, and it lights the room. But in reverse, your image is bounced back through that mirror, and things can be seen. But only if the light's on, right? You can stand in a dark room, and you can't see much in a mirror. Once you turn the light on, everybody that's in the room can see what's reflected in the mirror. Closing thought. If we believe this, then, then we want the information. We want the enlightenment. And if, if we are truly reflecting what is good, it glorifies God. If we are glorifying God, then he wants to dwell with us. No more difficult than that. Let's close this all. Book number 85, Send the Light. Number 85.
Our loving Heavenly Father and our Almighty God, we are truly thankful for all that you have done for us, all the good gifts you have given, not the least of which is your words of hope and promise, the historical records that we have of those things that have happened in the past that show how you respond to people's behavior and the things that you do for them and the things that you do against them and those things that you prophesy to do in the future. We pray that we may be with, in alignment with you and where we have sinned, that you will forgive us. And we pray, Father, that you will be with all of those who are here today, that you would guide and protect and comfort and heal, and not ourselves only, but also those of your people that are scattered across the earth, that we might also be found ready and be found righteous when you send your Son, and that we might be granted place in your kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.